daar is hij. Ja, ja! Daar is Klaassen, goal! Hello, the Football Anja podcast is back. I'm Michael Statham and I'm with Mike Bell for podcast 55, where we're going to discuss all of the latest happenings across the Eredivisie and Dutch football in general and sort of previewing the season ahead and the transfer business so far for all of the biggest teams in the Netherlands. You're listening to us on YouTube, SoundCloud or iTunes. Make sure to drop us a like, leave a comment on what you thought about this podcast and subscribe wherever you are. Enjoy. Mike, how are you doing? You're looking forward to the new Eredivisie season? Yeah, yeah, it's getting closer now and uh, the action kicks off this week with the clubs in Europe and uh, it's getting that exciting time now where we're just waiting for it to get started. And meanwhile, all the Eredivisie clubs have been really busy with transfers and getting ready for the new season. And some clubs, particularly last season's sort of top five, they are preparing for European fixtures too. So I think today what we're going to try and do is do it almost club by club. And the first one I think we should talk about is PSV because they have their European fixture first. Um, they've got a qualifier against Basel, home and then away. Home match being on the 23rd of July, return being on the 30th. They've had a little bit of transfer business, haven't they, so far this summer? But are they ready for the fixture on Tuesday? Is their squad ready to go? It's a difficult one because I could say the same for Basel. I know that they're in a bit of turmoil in Switzerland, so I don't think either club's really prepared for this game. I think that PSV really expected more interest than some of their players. I think that that slowed them down this summer. So I think that they were expecting a lot of interest in Lozano and Bergwijn, which was going to give them you know, tons of money, like an 80 million incoming that they could again go out and sign a few players, but that's just not come around yet. And, you know, Bergwijn's only been interested, apparently been interested in Ajax and Sevilla, who aren't willing to meet, you know, their asking price for them. So I think they've slowed down, but they've got Ruma, who I think is a good signing. And I think he'll look good in the attack. But other than that, the two left backs have signed Bascagli and Tony Lato. Question marks. I've never really seen them play, so I don't know much about them. Will they be an upgrade on Angelino? Let's wait and see. And then Athelai, he's injury prone. He's not ready yet. He's not fit. So I think that the PSV squad still now lacks two or three players. I think that you saw in the preseason friendlies that there were, especially the one against Wolfsburg, that they lost. They just seem to have no creativity. And without Luke de Jong, they seem to lack a bit of leadership as well, which isn't coming through from the likes of Hendricks. Yeah, they've lost um, a few key players so far, but compared to, say, um, their rivals at Ajax, um, if PSV sell one of their best players, they're just not going to get the big transfer fee that Ajax have been getting because of the players' potential. Luke de Jong and Angelino went for just over €20 million altogether. Daniel Schwab, their key centre-back last season, left for free. So I guess, yeah, they haven't had the money to go and spend on these new players and even if even so far you can see they've just had a couple of free transfers or or loan players but yeah they did invest in Bruma um club record fee um from Leipzig uh I think he'll be a fantastic winger but that raises question marks about Berkvine you know is he going to stay or leave um but also Lozano as well I don't think the three of them are going to be at the club together so yeah you said a point about how there's not been that much interest in their key players. And yet, the Berkvine and Lozano at the moment are staying at the club. I think, personally, that Lozano will leave eventually and Berkvine will stay, which would leave PSV in a decent place to be, um, considering they've replaced uh, the left-back Angelino with, with um, Tony Lato. Boscagli might well be a centre-back um, rather than left-back for PSV. So they've got, they've got options and I think they've got a big enough squad for this European ties coming up and also the Super Cup coming up versus Ajax. So I think PSV aren't a terrible place to be ahead of the Basel game. But I just worry that they're going to lack something, um, perhaps midfield, because that was their problem last season. They, they played three young midfielders. Um, I, I, I just don't see how Van Bommel still thinks that Hendricks and Rosario together in midfield is still going to work, because it never really does. And Sadilek's not really cutting the mustard. He's not adding much quality to the attack. Um, and Ihatare is still very young. So there's still that main issue of their midfield um, as they go into the Basel tie. Uh, but how, how do you feel about them getting over that in two legs? Is it something they can be, feel quite confident about? Yeah, I mean, on paper, you'd say that PSV have a stronger team because I think Basel have gone backwards. I know that they're a regular 
Champions League side, you expect them to be in the Champions League. But over the past couple of years, I think they've degraded. And, you know, they've got Ricky Van Roeswinkle, we all know him up front. Um, but other than that, they don't really have any of the really top quality youngsters that Basel's really been known for in the past couple of years. And I think PSV, if they can sort, if Van Bommel can basically get his midfield right and Daniel Malin can get the goals up front to replace Luke De Jong, then yeah, I can see them. I think the home leg is very important. I need to get a win and then hopefully a clean sheet and then just go finish the job in Switzerland. Um, and I read a question from Toto Ramdata. Thanks for thank everyone that sent in questions on Twitter, by the way. Please keep them coming in future podcasts. He, first of all, asked if Berkvain will leave this summer. I think after the interest from Ajax has sort of fizzled away, it, it looks like he might well be staying. But uh, his second question was, it's early days, but it looks like Mark Van Bommel hasn't learnt from his team selections from last season. What do you think he needs to do? For me, he needs to sort, I think you've already touched on it, sort of as midfielder. He's playing Hendricks, Rosario, Sadelik, sometimes interchanging. He doesn't need two defensive midfielders in most games. He needs to find a way to get Gutierrez in there. I think all the PSV fans want to see more of him. When he does start, he seems to add something going forward, a better quality. And eventually, if they do sell Pereiro, which they're trying to do because he's coming into last year of his contract, they need to sign an attacking midfielder. Yeah, Athelai could probably do a job in that role, but he's getting older and there's doubts over his fitness. They would probably love to get Marco Van Hinkle back, but he can't. So maybe just add in another attacking midfielder to create something for the forwards. Why don't you think that uh, Van Hinkle will, won't come back to PSV? Because he's still injured, I think. I think he's out for three or four months now. I don't think that PSV will bring him back until maybe January, if they were going to try anything. Yeah, what a shame, though, because... You know, he was a really good player when PSV had him for that whole season. Um, he was key in um, lifting the Eredivisie title. He scored 14 goals in, in an Eredivisie season, in which he didn't even play every single game. Um, it's, it's a shame that he, he couldn't kick on and become an Evans international because he definitely had the potential, didn't he? Yeah, and he's a leader. So you're thinking, of, Luke de Jong's gone. Who's going to take the armband? Somebody like Van Hinkle would have been perfect. So... Yeah, it's a shame. I think the final question about PSV we had from, was from Abdul, and he wants to know if PSV can make it to the Champions League. But of course, this isn't the only round of qualifying for PSV, is it? And no, to get past Basel, it gets much tougher in the next one. You know, Ajax have got an easier route because obviously they're champions, so they get some easier cups. But yeah, PSV could get some really tough ties if they get through this one. Yeah, so I think we'll be very surprised if PSV can make it to the group stages um, of the Champions League. But let's hope they can at least get some European football um, until winter. So that leads us on quite nicely to Ajax then. Um, so they've had, um, I would say, well, do you agree, Mike? I think they've done the best out of all the Dutch clubs in the Eredivisie this summer with their business so far. We all knew they were going to lose players, but they've invested, or reinvested, the money they've accrued really well, haven't they? Yeah, they have. They've done really well they've kept the ones that they wanted to keep you know the Dusan Tadic's the Hakim ZX they're still there Donny van der Beek is still there all three of them will be so important going forward and they've added some quality and some good youngsters as well I think that promise will turn out to be a great signing for them and at the back they've got this Alvarez coming in to replace Delict because I think that you know we can all say that they've probably made a huge error in signing with Sandro Magellan, I think he's turned out to be an absolute disaster. So two centre-backs were needed this summer and uh, they've got them in Pieri and, and Alvarez. I think that they've done their business quickly. They've done it in time for them. And they enter the Champions League qualifiers that will probably all be wrapped up. And that's great for them because they need to get through that qualifier against some potentially tricky sides. You know, the likes of PAOK from Greece, Maccabee, Red Star Belgrade, um, AIK from Sweden, Dundalk, some... Okay, teams are never ones you expect Ajax to, to get past. And yeah, it's just a good that Ten Hag's got his squad ready for it. The Champions route is a lot easier to qualify through um, than the one that PSV have to go through. Um, and it gets more difficult each time the UEFA keep changing the rules for poor second place in the Eredivisie. But yeah, the transfer business has been incredible when you think about the money that they've got in so far. I guess they've been lucky with that. You know, PSV haven't had the luck of having... Um, that £70, £80 million pound player. Um, so far this summer, if we're speaking in English pounds here, Ajax have, have taken in 
164 million and only spent about 51. So that's quite the profit. And yet they've still managed to strengthen themselves. I don't think they've actually made themselves a weaker team with their business so far because Edson Alvarez is um, a great young player coming in from Mexico. Quinta Promes is someone who's at his prime coming in from Sevilla, where, yeah, he probably didn't play at his best with Sevilla, but he's shown with the Dutch national team that he can really turn it on. And I think in the Eredivisie, you're going to see something similar to Tadic, where he can score lots of goals. But that's not uh, all as well. I just said about Tadic. Signing a, 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 well, basically a lifelong contract at Ajax until um, 2026. That's incredible. Um, he's with them for the rest of his playing career. So that's really good news for Ajax fans. that They've got to keep one of their best players just because he's so happy at the club. Yeah, and you hope that in the future, then the players like Donny van der Beek will see that and he signs a new deal. And going forward, if Casper Dober can find his form again, they've got, you know, they've got a squad there that has lost De Jong and it has lost De Ligt. They're two exceptional players. But the spine of the squad that got so far in the Champions League is still there. And, you know, Andre Onana, we all thought he was going to go. He stayed around. So, yeah, I think that Ten Hag's got a squad that's capable of getting to the Champions League group stages again, doing something there, and it should be the favourite for the Eredivisie title as well. A couple of questions then from Twitter. Um, let's have this first one here from Abdul, and he, he wants to know if anyone else, do we, do we expect anybody else to leave Ajax this summer? I think you're still looking at Hakim Ziyech towards the end of the transfer window. There are some clubs that haven't really done much business so far around Europe and might be tempted to make an offer him, if, especially if his transfer fee is only around 30 million. You're looking at the, the Arsenal's, the Bayern Munich that apparently might have him on their, their wish list. We just need to wait and see, but I think that ZX got a big question mark around him. Why isn't he so popular though still? Why, why is it that he can't command um, a transfer? It's been going on for years now with him. It was lucky that Ajax took him away from FC Twente when they did. That was late in the transfer window. But Ajax have made well known that Ziyech is only available for around 30 million euros. That's a snip for so many clubs around Europe. Why are they apprehensive to sign him? It's, it baffles me. And the only thing I can think of is, you know, a year ago there might have been some, you know, issues about temperament and his attitude. But I think he's dissolved all that in the past year. I think he's been excellent for Ajax. He, last season was his best yet in his career and yet he still can't get a move. You know, last summer the move to Roma broke down but that was because Roma just you know, they agreed a fee basically with Ajax and then just gave up trying to sign him and then it's it's a strange one to me because if somebody gets him for 30 million that's probably one of the bargains of the summer. So, you know, I, I still expect him to leave but I'm, I'm very, very surprised that somebody hasn't already snapped him up. Yeah, same. Uh, and the second question was from Elder Pigeon, who tends to send his questions in. He also uh, thanked us and congratulated us for the podcast. We're glad to be back as well. Um, and his question was about the Ajax defence. Uh, he lists some players here who are the options. There's Edson Alvarez, there's Pers Hurs, um, Kik Piri, um, Lissandra Magallan. But there's also um, Dave Lint still available as a centre-back. So who do you think, Mike, is is likely to partner Blint at centre-back this season for Ajax as a first choice? First choice would have to be Alvarez. I think they're bringing him in as the replacement for Delict, as I said already. I think Magellan's a disaster and I think he's going to go right down the pecking order. I'd be surprised if Ajax don't even try and get rid of him for the transfer windows up. Pieri might be one for the future and same with Skurs, but both of them have done really well in pre-season. I think that Pieri, he's joined from Heerenveen where he was a guaranteed starter. He won't want to be just a bench player, so I think he'll be third choice behind the first two. You never know, like, with Daily Blind, he can move into midfield. And, you know, you've got Lasse Shona and Carl Eiting as the defensive midfield at the moment, but, you know, Daily Blind can do that job as well, and you could get an Alvarez and Pieri partnership for some games. It's Ten Hag has had so many options. Yeah, he really does. And another option is perhaps Blind at left back as well. Um, in the absence of Tagliafico and yet Serginio Dest um, the new new player on the scene 18 years old him and Persius have both been two brilliant young players um, standing out in Ajax's pre-season just to further add to Eriksen Hag's headache Yeah it's great to see especially with 
Scrubs because you know he left for Trinidad after they got promoted and went to Ajax. He was going to be the next big star, and then you know he didn't really do much for a young Ajax last year. I think he made a couple of mistakes, but so far in preseason he's been excellent. And Des just looks like a sensational fullback, and I'm a bit guy that Netherlands don't seem to be able to convince him to switch his allegiances from the American national team. He was born in the Netherlands, but he seems pretty set on. Representing America, which is a shame because a fullback position is one of the Netherlands ones that could do with some new new faces. Yeah, one one place that definitely will be filled for a while is um, centre back role for the Netherlands, uh, with Virgil Van Dijk being on top of the world at the moment, but also Matthijs De Ligt who ended up leaving for Ajax for Juventus. Um, so we, we you know we haven't had a chance to discuss his move to Juventus. Do you think that's the right club for him? Yeah, I do. I think it's. Perfect club for him. I think he's going to Italian football, which is known for, you know, it's great defenders and it's where great defenders go to to raise their game. I think that PSG would have been a mistake, maybe, but you know he would have cruised through a lot of games like he does with Ajax. He would have been playing with maybe better players and going for the Champions League. But I think it, Juventus, he gets the win from Lisa Bonucci and I think that will help his game. You know, the leadership you'll see from Buffon. Ronaldo, Benucci, Chiellini, it's just going to help him going forward. I think everyone's dream was that both of them would end up at Barcelona, but I just don't think that was ever going to be the case this summer. And I think all, of, all the rest of the clubs after Barcelona, Juventus was definitely the best choice. It's a good signing um, for Juventus to, to have. Um, I, I don't think it's the wrong club for him at all. Um, but I, I don't think it was De Ligt's first choice. I think it would have, yeah, he would have loved to have gone to Barcelona or maybe even by Munich. Um but it's not a bad place to be, is it? I'm sure he's earning a ton there. Um, yeah. And I think we should move on to the next club on our list. I think that's finals. So they've had a rather topsy-turvy summer. They've got rid of a couple of their key players um, and brought in a couple of players. But um, a question from Toto Rondelt, uh, he he asked, do you think final will be challenges for the title this year? I think that's a nice way of opening a discussion about final because surely the answer is no. Yeah, no, no, they won't. Um, unless they sign three or four players of good quality, I can't see them challenging at all. I think that, you know, you lose Van Persie and you lose you know, Tony Valhena, two of the best players last season. And the three that have brought in so far, Liam Kelly, you know, Reading were willing to let him go for free. It's not really a good sign. I've, I've heard a lot of fans saying that he's good. I've already seen anything of him. Could be a great signing. We'll have to wait and see. I don't think that's a position that they really needed anybody in. They've got Koku and they've got Turnstra, both decent attacking midfielders. And then you've got Luciano Narsing, who spent you know, the last two seasons in the wilderness. Is he going to be raring to go straight from the start of the season? Probably not. And then the first signing was a goalkeeper, which they just don't need because they've already got Bailo and Kenneth Vermeer. It's not been a great summer transfer window so far. They're still trying to get in Leroy Fair. I don't know why it's taken so long because Fair seems willing to go back. He's training with them, give him a contract. Even had El Yero Elia trying to flirt with them and come back, but Feyenoord said, no, it's not possible. I think that they're going to be relying on a lot of youth players in the next few months. I think that you know Jorgensen's injured. If you look past him, who's going to play up front for them? They've got Dylan Venter, who didn't really impress last season when he was given a chance. Got a kid called Banis who looks quite promising. I already could play somebody like Steven Berghaus through the middle. But I think that you've got to worry about him eventually leaving. I think that they've resisted PSV so far. But I think that if the signs don't come, will Berghaus really want to stay there? Probably not. He's coming to the twilight of his career. If he sees the opportunity to go somebody like PSV and play in the Champions League, he'll want to take it. And I think he could end up forcing the move. And then it'd be an absolute disaster for Feyenoord because it just look. Right now, they're weaker than they were last season. And that's saying something as well, because final were very stale last season, and we were looking forward to them having a change of hands, um, Yarp Stam coming in and adding some fresh impetus. But yeah, so far, they've got rid of um, Vilhena. Classy didn't set the world alight, but he's also gone. Um, Van Persie, of course, he just said. Um, yeah, it's it's been, it's been really actually quite... Um, tepid their summer it's been way below par they have not signed the players they need to sign 
I think Luciano Narsing may be a good a good addition in the end. People are raising concerns about the fact that he couldn't play for a championship club, but Swansea didn't play Narsing because of um, a clause in his contract, meaning that if he played another game, he would have had to have they would have had to have paid PSV more money. So as a consequence, they decided not to play him for the best part of a year um, and let him rot in the reserves because he couldn't get a transfer in January. I think Narsing was just happy to continue earning the money that he did because it was effectively a Premier League wage in the Championship. Um, as in terms of other signings, Liam Kelly, I, he didn't really um, turn it on for Reading, but I heard that under Stan, he was a really good player to have around because of the way that he played um, and that suits Stan's style. Whether or not he plays as a 10 or an 8, we yet to see. But as you said, Mike, it's the midf- not the midfield that needs strengthening. It's around that. They need to have another striker with Jorgensen. Um, unless Stan sees Dylan Venter as a, a really good second choice, which last season he didn't really prove to be. And the other key position is centre-back, because Botterheen and Van der Heiden, two really quite ageing, quite slow centre-backs. Van Beek is extremely slow as well, even though he's only about 25. Um, and past that, they have very few options. Sam Hendricks is a young left-back who can also play centre-back but again, shouldn't really be the, the future for this season. I just don't know why Stam hasn't come in and really grabbed it by both the horns. He had a long time to prepare because he knew that he was going to be final manager for a long time whilst he was at Pexwaller. I just don't understand why he hasn't made any more transfers than he has, unless he, ha- unless he has no money to spend. Because so far, it's all been free transfers. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's quite a disappointing start for Stam because you think he would have had his squad assembled pretty quickly, especially if Tony Verheyen left for quite a lot of money, you think that some of that would have been made available for him. Um, you definitely need some new defenders, I think, especially because they've been playing St. Juster, who could possibly be their best centre-back on the right-hand side. I think eventually, hopefully, he can move back into the centre because that's the position that he's shown for Heronveen, and that's the one that looked like he was going to be a big star and potentially a Netherlands international, but he's been stuck out on the right-hand side because you know, that's what Van Bronckers did to him last season. And, yeah, going forward, I mean, they've got options. If Berger stays, you know, Narsing and Berger's on the right, on the left, you've got people like Sam Larson still there. Still yet to see what Sinistera can do, the Colombian. I just, you know, I worry about Feyenoord coming into their Europa League qualifiers. They could get drawn against some tough sides like Austria, Vienna, um, Belgian side Antwerp. These aren't the biggest sides on paper, but if Feyenoord are low in confidence, don't have Jorgensen because he's injured and haven't got a settled squad, these are the sort of games that we've seen in the past that those sides get knocked out of. And I think another season of no European football for Feyenoord would be a disaster because I think money is already a big issue at the club. We also last season, the quality of team that final were knocked out by um what was the name of that team again they had a final defeat against them didn't they in the summer you saw the last season when they got knocked out by trends and that a final can and dutch clubs in general can all be knocked out by clubs that you wouldn't expect them to be so yeah it's a worrying few weeks for them i know that fans aren't really happy their open day is usually a big celebration where they bring out their new signings and via helicopter and they're all a bit underwhelmed that only three the golf were liam kelly narsing and, and marsman when you've had options around, you know, you, you're looking at, you could have had to be right fair in there. And if you want a new striker, there's one sitting at Tottenham right now that we'll get onto a bit later. I know there's a question about him, but maybe they could have struck a little loan deal with Tottenham for Vincent Janssen, you never know. And then he would have been a perfect signing for him. Get the excitement going and to keep get some fresh blood in there, some experience to go along with these really talented youngsters that have got like Koku in midfield, Berger in midfield. Turi on the right, um, Azarkan, I think he's shown in pre-season as well. They've got really good youth players in there. They just need to assemble a squad, and I think they're two or three players short of that. Yeah, you mentioned Vincent Janssen there. Um, we had a question from Chenk, and he wondered if there would ever be a Vincent Janssen revival. Um, so is it likely that he'll move to Mexico? If Mexican reports can be believed, I don't think there's been anything in the Dutch press so far. They're all saying that he's going to sign for Monterey on Monday. The, basically, the deal is done. All he needs to do is go for a medical. I've seen one report saying that it's basically done. The only thing that can stop it is if 
something comes in at the last minute and stops him going there, which I'm really, really hoping does happen. Because, you know, Vincent Janssen, yeah, he's been poor for, for Tottenham and he's had his injury problems. He probably would have stayed at Fenerbahce if he didn't get injured. And he was basically out for all of last season. You know, there's clubs like Real Betis and Schalke that were linked to him. I think they would have been much better fit for him. And, you know, you go to Mexico, are you going to come back into contention for the Dutch national team? No, because I don't think that Ronald Koeman's going to be looking at the Mexican league as any sort of, you know, level for what he needs. And, yeah, at 25, going to Mexico, it's, it's not looking good for him. No, it's definitely not. Um, and it, and it, it, the amount of transfers that have been going out of the country this summer, you'd have thought... Um... Janssen would have had a chance at one of the biggest clubs in the Netherlands. Uh, this brings me on to the question from Gareth. Is there any concern in the Netherlands at the exodus of talent we're seeing from the area to Vizier this summer? Um, and and does it, do you think it will have a negative effect on the teams in European competitions? I think just before I let Mike offer his opinion that this is, of course, always a regular occurrence in the Netherlands that teams will lose their best players. It always feels like there are too many players leaving the country um, and not many of the stars remain. Um, but do you agree with that, Mike? And, and do you think it's going to have a negative effect on the teams in European competitions this summer? Um, I don't think it's going to have an impact on the European competitions because you know, I think if you look at the teams that are in there, I think PSV will sign players. Ajax will sign. We've already talked about them too being OK. You know, fine or yeah, they've lost a couple, but I think you're more looking down the league. I think that the clubs like Heracles and they've lost their best players. It's going to affect clubs like that and the strength of them being able to even put a challenge in for these teams like Ajax and, and PSV because if they get weaker, then PSV or just PSV and Ajax will just beat them by even bigger margins than they already were. So you're looking at strength around the league, which isn't really there at the moment. Um, I don't think there's many clubs around outside the top five or six who have really strengthened their squads. So I think that's the bigger worry. Um, they've lost, some of them have lost their best players. Yunus Namwe at Pex 4, he's went to Russia. So yeah, I think the talent drain is always there. It happens every year. But then again, there's always youngsters that emerge. You know, I have to look at you know, AZ squad and the talents that are coming through there. There's definitely going to be more and more coming through. and it's just the way the Dutch football is. Every year, these players come through, they, they impress and then they leave. It's just the way it is. Yeah, it's the way it's always been. Um, and it's always, it will be in the future. I think we're going to we're gonna touch upon two more Dutch teams in a moment uh, and how their transfer business is going this summer. But a quick glance for the league and you can see um, the impact it's having on, on the league and, and the amount of players that are coming in and, and, and going out. If you actually look at the league overall, um, there's only 80 million euros of transfer expenditures of, of money being spent by the Dutch clubs. And most of that's coming from Ajax and PSV, uh, unsurprisingly. But then there'll be there's, there's over a quarter, nearly, well, oh yeah, over a quarter of a billion euros of, of players that have gone out. So it's very clear to see where, you know, the, the, mon the money's going. It's going out of the league as, as usual. They're all selling clubs in the Netherlands. But there are, there are teams this summer that have made very few signings, but some that have made loads of signings. It's really interesting how some clubs have been very quiet this summer. And it's unlike Dutch clubs to make loads of transfers in August and later in the transfer window. They like to get their business done before now. Um, I think there are some clubs that have had good summers, the likes of Emmen have. Peck Swalla have actually signed a, a fair few players of, of decent calibre for the area de Vizier. Um, Twente, Vitesse have made some OK signings. Um, two more that we're going to touch upon in a moment. But there are also clubs that have made very poor signings, or none at all. Arda Den Haag, Willem Twe, um, Sparta and RKC Varvijk have made a very, very few signings since their promotion. Um, Hedekles as well, again, just just quite weak signings um, that, that aren't going to strengthen their team, considering the players they've lost. Um, is that to a detriment for the league again this season? Because we said that last summer, didn't we? How some teams just weren't spending anything and weren't strengthening their teams perhaps because they were very confident that they could just stay up because there were teams that were always going to be worse than them. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's... They saw the likes of Emin coming up and Fortuna Sittard and thought that you know, these two clubs aren't probably not going to 
be able to survive in the, the top fight, especially Emin, who were there for the first time and they did so well. Because they came up, they had a plan, they had a set squad and they did it brilliantly. And <clears throat> there's just some clubs in there, division right now are stagnating. I think that you'd expect somebody like Heron being, after having such a poor campaign last time out, yeah, they'd go out and strengthen their squad. I think that you know, they've got one really good player in, I think that odd guard that's on loan from Sassuolo, I think he's been really impressive during pre-season, he's scored some great goals, he looks like a really good youngster and a really good striker for the Dutch league, but you know, clubs like that should be champing out a bit because they could all be challenging for European places. You know, you look at final squad and you're thinking that they could be got at, and you're looking at Vitesse and AZ and Utrecht, these teams can all challenge for a top three spot and then below that it's just going to be I think, you know, again, same as last year, seven or eight teams that could probably go down if they have a bad campaign. But I am glad to see FC20 back in the league and I think that they've done some shrewd business. They seem to have good links in Spain and they're getting good youngsters from the from La Liga, so it's going to be exciting to see what they can do back in the, the big time. Yeah, it's great to see a club of their stature back in the league. Um but the transfer business they've done for a club that's just come back up, they haven't spent any actual money, but the fact that they could persuade the likes of Paul, Paul Verhaak, I can never say his name, by the way. Paul Verhaak? Paul Verhaak? How do you say that? Paul Verhaak. Not bad. We'll take that. He's yeah. a very experienced right back that's coming from the Bundesliga. Um, as well as that, yes, and some players that have their Spanish links as well. There's some good players on loan. Um for example, Matos, uh, the left back from Cadiz. Uh, there's players that have top level experience, um, La Liga experience, for example, which I'm sure will help the league out. It's going to help Twente to have a good season. Just to touch upon Vitesse as well. They've made they made a higher number of signings, but they, they haven't again spent much money in doing so. And I, I'm not. Sure. What do you think about their signings, Mike? Do you think they're of good quality? For example, um, the only transfer they've actually paid any money for was Thomas Hajek the centre-back from Pilsen. Apart from that, it's free transfer, Lamprey from Ajax, um, Osama Tanana, who had a good season before with Heracles, coming from St Etienne, on, only on loan though. Another loan, uh, J.Y. Hot from Leeds, um, Obispo from PSV, the centre-back, uh, Bazur has come in from Wolfsburg. They, they're players that might have potential, but are they likely to give Vitesse that push for a top four place? Well, I think we've all been waiting for Bazur to do something since he left Ajax and you know, I thought he was okay for Utrecht when he came back at the end of last season and you know I'm a bit surprised that Vitesse have actually been able to get him in um, and they've actually, when I saw that he signed for him I thought it would be a loan deal but a three year contract it gives him a chance to get regular first team action and get his career back on track. <laughs> what I'm most interested in is, is Jay Rae Grot because you know, he seems to always get picked for He's in everyone's youth squad, the under 21s, under 20s, even though he's not really doing much. So these Netherlands youth coaches must see something in them. You know, it didn't work out at Leeds. He was okay at BVV last season, but he's, he seems to be failing upwards because he's got moved to on loan to the test and the expectations got to be much higher this season for him. And I'm interested to see what he can do because he seems to have all the you know, capabilities of, to be a great striker. You know, he's big, strong, he's fast, he can dribble, he can, he's can. he got a powerful shot on him, he, he's got everything. He can score his head. So, you know, this is the big challenge for him this season is can he progress to the level where, you know, a few years ago we were saying that he could be a really top striker. So I'm interested to see what he can do. But Vitesse, you know, they've lost Martin Odegaard. He was their, their superstar last season. So we need to see how they cope without him. And yeah, Bazor and Grot, I think, are two, two very good signings if they are up to the level. So we've gone a little while around the top three in our podcast. We've also talked about a fair few of the other teams' uh, transfer business in the Eredivisie. But there's two fairly significant teams that I think we can talk about to finish our podcast, Mike. And that's RZ and Utrecht. Um, they've had interesting summers and I think Utrecht have had a better summer than RZ. But they've also got the old RZ manager, John van den Brom. Um, I personally thought that that RZ's very quiet summer um, and almost relying a lot upon youth players that they've been developing um, and 
given the fact that they've lost Arda Maher on a free transfer to their rivals, Utrecht. Um, and the fact that Utrecht have been signing some decent players for good money this summer, for example, Dalmau from uh, Heracles. Is that a sign that, that times might be changing and that RZ may have a big challenger this season um, for the top four, maybe even top three? Yeah, I think that you look at Utrecht and the business they've done this summer and you've got to say as a club, it's definitely on the up because you know, they've attracted the likes of Adam Meyer, who could have signed a long-term contract for AZ, but he seems to be charmed by the fact that Van den Brom's gone to Utrecht. And, you know, they've signed Dalmau, who's had a great season at Heracles, and he's an absolute upgrade on Dessers that they had before. They've got, you know, still got Baha Beck up front. And Vaclav Czerny coming in from Ajax, you know, he was, a couple of years ago, everyone was getting very excited about him being a really top-class winger, but injuries haven't helped. But if he can hit the ground running, then that's another great attacking player that they've got. And they just have seemed to have a solid squad of options in every single position. You've got them in the field, they've got Gustafsson in there as well, who's top quality for this league, and their defence is strong. You know, <laughs> AZ, they seem to be happy just to go with youth this season. They brought in Slot, who's you know a youth trainer by trade. Only made one signing, uh, Sugawara, the the right back on loan from, I think it's a Japanese club. You know, he expected them to bring maybe a couple of players in, but they're trying to get rid of a few that just aren't going. And I know they're trying to get rid of Bjorn Johnson and Marko Vajinovic, who haven't left yet. And there's always rumours about Idrissi going to Krasnodar, but that seems to have fallen through. So I don't know if their business is going to come later in the window because there's a few positions around the, the squad that I think need a bit of strength, and especially replacing Adam Mara, because if you've lost him in midfield, the options to replace him are very, very slim. Um, unless they're going to move Toon Miners, who they played as centre-back last year, back into his natural position of the midfield. Then up front, you've got Boadu, who, yeah, he's one of the greatest talents that everyone's had at the moment, but he's had two very serious injuries. Can he come back from that? And his backup is Ferdi Druth, the a striker who was out on loan last season, he scored tons of goals in the, the second division for Young AZ and then NAC Nijmegen. Is he going to be of air divisie quality? Let's just wait and see because if those two don't get the goals, then well, AZ don't really have much about them. Um, so I think, yeah, if you're looking at a challenger for the top three positions, you track to look very good at the moment, then it'll be AZ and Feyenoord battling that ball. And on that note as well about the fact that they are um, teams that look strong in the Eredivisie, it's how will they get on in the Europa League. We've discussed PSV's finals and Ajax's chances in Europe this season, but can Utrecht and can RZ get through their qualifiers to reach the group stages of the Europa League? Yes, yeah, it's, it's two very important teams. I think that if you look at the coefficient, you're looking at at least one of these two getting to the group stages to really help. Because last year it was all on Ajax, so you can't have that again. So we need at least one of these teams to get there. The Trek, they seem to have an easier opener, but again, we've seen that them lose to some really poor sides in the past. You think that the squad's stronger now, they've got a really good manager, so it shouldn't happen. They've got um, Mostar, I'm not going to say their full name because I can't pronounce it, but they finished second in Bosnia last year. But then if they get through that, you know, you've got tougher ties against like, say, Spar Prague, Espanyol, AK Athens, um, Russian sides like Arsenal, Tua, Zoria from Ukraine, even Malmo. Um, these are tough sides for a, a club like Utrecht. Maybe it's 50-50. We saw a couple of years ago they gave Zenit a good ride for the, run for the money. So you never know. But AZ, you got BK Hacken finished fifth in Sweden last year. Then they could get the likes of Rangers from, from Scotland, a Czech side like uh, Jablonek, Wesky Sofia, a Traumatos from Greece. Now, their size that they should really be beating, I think Rangers is one that they might want to avoid. But yeah, I think AZ have a great chance to reach net, then Utrecht is just maybe 50 50 because they could get a really, really tough draw in the next round. It's so tricky for Dutch teams because they're, they're as usual, they'll always lose their best players and have to redevelop the younger players who just aren't quite ready at this stage of the season and that always seems to be the case with Dutch teams they always seem to get knocked out of Europe then 
go on to fly throughout the season as some of their young players become their best players. Let's hope, though, that RZ and Utrecht can make it through three rounds of qualifying each and make it through to the group stages. But it's so tricky now. It's so tricky for Dutch teams to make it through. Um, and you just can't take it for granted. It would be fantastic if three of the teams could be in group stages um, by the autumn. But if all five do, that's really unlikely, but it would really help out the Dutch coefficient and Dutch football as a whole. Uh, well, Mike, thank you very much for joining me. And let's hope we have a, a really positive podcast to talk about in the near future um, regarding European fixtures and Dutch football teams. Yeah, come on, PSV, Utrecht and AZ. Let's get three wins in a row. Thanks for listening, everybody. And don't forget to send your questions in for the next podcast, which may be in a week or two as well. Thank you. That is back up. That is back up. That is it. Yeah. 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 That is it. Yeah. Yeah. That is class. Go on.